Good morning. Let's start the Lobster Management Board meeting. It's 11.20. My name is Daniel McKiernan from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I'm the chairman. I'll be chairing today's meeting. First on the business is uh, approval of the agenda. Are there any changes needed to the agenda? S seeing none, uh, can I get uh, approval of the proceedings from the October 2014 meeting? Bill Adler, motion to approve the proceedings. Do I have a second? Second by Malcolm. Next public comment. Is there anyone who would like to speak on any of the items that are not on the agenda today? Malcolm from New York. Oh, Emerson. Oh, Emerson. I'm sorry. Emerson, my bad. I can't see that far. No public comment. No one waiting to speak. Thank you. Uh, number four on the agenda is consider approval um, or review and approval of a draft addendum 24 for public comment uh, has to do with the uh, reconciliation of some of the rules concerning transferable traps for areas uh, two, three, and the outer cape. And this is an effort that uh, we've been working on behind the scenes for many weeks and months and years. Uh, it's an ASMFC uh, attempt to uh, improve the regulations regulations to match up with recently enacted federal regulations and I'm going to let Marin Hawk speak to those. Thank you Mr. Chairman. So this is draft addendum 24 for a board review. If you recall, the federal plan recently released their final rules for trap transferability, and so federal and state trap transferability plans are not consistent. Draft addendum 24 was initiated to ensure consistency between these two plans. This is the timeline for draft addendum 24. The current step is February 2015. The board will review this draft and make any necessary changes. And pending approval for public comment, it would then be released for public comment. So there are three different issues that this draft addendum deals with. The first is a conservation tax. The commission plan has a 10% conservation tax on full and partial business transfers. However, the federal plan that was recently released taxes only the partial business transfers. And the federal um, support for that was the transfer tax on full business transfers was not necessary to prevent the activation of latent effort and then the current regulations provide sufficient controls for that latent effort. So the two options for this issue are option A, status quo. The commission will keep the 10% conservation tax on both full and partial business transfers. And option B, which is to remove the conservation tax on full business transfers. Issue two deals with trap increments. In the federal final rule, the trap transfers may, pr may be processed in 10 trap increments. The state plan has a variety of different transfer requirements for each different management area. The federal regulations allow for fewer, trap tra tr fewer traps to be transferred at one time, thus allowing more flexibility for a federal permit holder in the trap transfer process. And so the two options for this issue are option A, status quo, the trap increments for each management area remain the same, and those are outlined in draft addendum 24. And option B, which is a trap transfer increment of 10 traps for all areas where trap transferability programs exist. And issue three deals with dual permit transfers. Currently in the Commission plan, dual permit holders, which are a state and federal permit holder for the same area, may only transfer traps to a dual permit holder of the same state. The federal plan allows any federal lobster permit holder to purchase federal trap allocation from a federal lobster permit holder with a qualified allocation in Area 2, Area 3, or the Outer Cape. And in, since the draft addendum 24 has been released, there's been a slight change in the language in that addendum, and so I just wanted to read this into the record. For the dual permit holder language, this paragraph will be inserted. If a dual permit holder chooses to purchase federal trap allocation from a dual permit holder from another state, only the federal allocation will transfer. So the buyer must also purchase state allocation from a per permit holder in his or her own state to align the federal and state allocations. If the state and federal allocations do not align, the permit holder 
closure is subject to the more restrictive of the state or federal allocations. It is recommended that states submit transfer rates and rate of trap attrition in their annual compliance report. The PRT will review these annually and provide a report to the board. If the board views the consolidation pattern as problematic, it can, comp it can propose corrective actions at a subsequent meeting. So again, that's just some language change in the addendum. And just to clarify, um, in the addendum, this is page seven, the second paragraph under option two. Uh, what Marin just read replaces that paragraph in its entirety. And this was uh, based on uh, uh, conversations that I have had with folks at the National Marine Fisheries Service uh, as we move forward to create these, these common rules. Uh, we've been getting some uh, very useful feedback uh, at some informal and, uh, meetings. Recently, we're at the Mass Lobstermen's Association, uh, and we presented a lot of this to the industry, and um, we've, we've gotten some good feedback. We've gotten excellent questions, and we feel that this really does need to be clarified. So why don't we take any questions on the three issues that are in this addendum, um, that being the, um, the elimination of the conservation tax when uh, fishermen sell their whole businesses, uh, the trap transfer increments, and then this new language. So is there any questions on any of this? All right, thank you very much. So um, with this, uh, replacement language, um, we would be looking for a motion to approve this addendum as drafted to go to public comment. I don't think we intend to um, hold formal public hearings on it, but we would we could if someone wanted to um, have a hearing in their state, but in Massachusetts I think we would just hold a public comment period. Bill Adler. Uh, before I make, I'll, I'll make that motion. But uh, this is this changes. What page did you say, uh, Bill? This changes page seven uh, under uh, okay. issue three, option two, second paragraph, in its entirety. And if if you want to, from a little bit of explanation, I can give you that. Well, I was just going to make the motion to approve okay. the uh, proposed addendum uh, 24 as amended and approve it for public hearing. All right. Is that what you need? Yes, thank you. Can I get a second? Can I get a second on that motion? Yes, um, Tom. Um, Tom Baum from New Jersey. Thank you. All right, any discussion? Steve Train. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have one question I wasn't sure I fully understood as I was thinking here. Um, on a, we're eliminating the tax on the total business transfer. Would that include a second permit that had bank traps? Would that be part of the business transfer or is that a separate permit? That, that, that's the only thing I'm not sure about. If an individual obtains a second permit with trap allocation, um, he can do that without having a transfer tax from the former holder to him. When he goes to move traps between those two permits, they would be taxed. Any other questions? The motion is to move to approve draft addendum 24 for public comment, contingent on changes discussed during the board meeting. Motion by Mr. Adler, second by Mr. Baum. Shall we take a vote? All in favor of the motion as approved? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Any null votes? So it's unanimous. Tony has Yes, it passed unanimously. Um, Tony Kearns uh, would like to speak. Just based on what you just said, Dan, then is it the intention of the board just to have this out for public comment for 30 days and not hold hearings in states since no fisheries recently also went out for comment on this as well as the commission did receive comments when we originally put these measures in place? Some of them. I think so, Tony. Is there anyone uh, in the affected states that would like a public hearing? 
I don't, I'm looking at uh, Bob Gibson. <laughs> When we have an opportunity to comment through the process yeah. that was just outlined. Thank you. Yeah. So, Tony, yes, just a public comment period. Um, all right. Next on the agenda is uh, review and consider LCME 5 request for a review of the season closure approved in October. Um, Tom O'Connell, you want to speak to that? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for this opportunity. Um, what I'm specifically um, going to request is a reconsideration of the action this board took in October, uh, which established a new closure area for LCMA Area 5 um, to be April uh, 29th through May 31st. And the reason I'm asking for reconsideration, as you can recall, at the last meeting, uh, we were responding to a technical committee evaluation of Addendum 17, which required a, a temporary percent reduction in, in uh, southern New England stocks. Um, based upon that uh, advice from the technical committee, we learned that area four and five were not achieving the 10 percent reduction, and therefore options were reviewed. Um, we came into the meeting to uh, make the argument that the overage in, overage in LCMA five was uh, minimal and would cause significant impact with little conservation benefit to the stock. Um, you all should have received the memo we put together. Um, the inaccuracy at the October meeting was when I asked a question about LCMA 5's overage, uh, staff responded that the overage was greater than 30,000 pounds. Um, that in fact turned out to be the total harvest for LCMA 5, and the overage was actually 1,100 pounds. Um, so, you know, we are requesting reconsideration with the goal of maintaining uh, the February-March closure that was um, uh, approved in Addendum 17. Um, I will say that Maryland does not have a significant harvest, nor number of lobster harvesters, um, but going to a May closure is going to have about a $25,000 impact. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but it's going to happen to just a couple of individuals. And this fishery is very important to them. It's also going to impact our lobster fishermen in Area 3, which fishes in the Area 3-5 overlap. Um, and because of enforcement and because of that overlap, they will no longer be able to land uh, lobsters um, during the month of May as well. There's also some economic impact on um, bycatch that may not continue with this closure. And I just wanted to make sure the board was aware about that. We just had a conversation about economics and the importance of the states to come forward to make sure this board understands the economic impact. So, you know, in summary, you know, recognizing the minimal contributions of the uh, Area 5 harvest to the stock and the economic impact, we'd like to, you know, request the board's reconsideration, and if that's approved, um, request the board's consideration to go back to status quo February and March closure. The last point I'll mention is that we just learned last week um, through a federal rule, uh, public notice from, the, from NOAA that um, they are... They have just adopted rules to maintain a February and March closure for 2016. And unless that rule can be changed, um, if this board does not reconsider this action, um, our fishermen would be looking at a three-month closure, um, those fishermen in New Jersey, in Delaware, perhaps, and in, in Maryland. So um, Marin has a uh, uh, motion to put on the table for reconsideration, if, if, um, unless there's discussion that you'd like to entertain beforehand. Yeah, why don't we have some discussion? if you don't mind, Tom. Is there anyone uh, who wants to discuss the specifics? Yes, Tom? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in, in light of the... Uh, the NOAA's final rule publication. Um, this this would create quite a quite of um, discrepancy as far as uh, the closures for New Jersey lobstermen. Um, areas four and five bisect right right down the middle of New Jersey, Barnegat Light, I believe. Um, some there are some holders that have both permits. They, when they, in the beginning of a fishing year, they do have to declare which area they're going to fish, but they are, they are restricted to both, both measures for, for, for those areas. So if there was, if the seasonal closures were not consistent between the two areas, they would have a more restrictive, you know, more restrictive seasons, not, not a, you know, up to three months or more of, of a closure. Um, 
so I, I'm not sure if it's a, appropriate for area four to be included in the motion. I'd also like to hear from Noah also about the final rule. And as, of, as Tom had mentioned, you know, is that the case? This is the final rule and that's what will happen in 2016. Thank you. Peter Burns, would you like to speak to that? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, to Tom's question, uh, we did publish a final rule in January, and that implements uh, the Area 4 and the Area 5 closures from February to February and March. So unless we did another uh, rule change between now and then, as uh, Tom O'Connell mentioned, uh, those, um, those closures would remain in, in effect. So I can, I can certainly see uh, Mr. O'Connell's point uh, that there was an, an error in the, in the information that was presented before the board, but I can also see New Jersey's point too because we've got uh, issues with consistency as well because we've got two areas that bisect one state and uh, so uh, it would be interesting to see what the impact potentially on area four may be um, if area five has, uh, area four and five have different closure periods. So just not sure if the technical committee looked at that or if there's been any analysis on that. Thank you, Peter. Unfortunately, the TC chairman wasn't able to attend today's meeting because of the disrupted travel situation, but uh, Bob Glenn has communicated to Tony, and maybe Tony can share uh, what she's learned from Bob. I'm going to do my best. I was hoping to get Bob on the phone, but we're having technical difficulties there as well. Um, so the technical committee did review the Area 4 proposal leading up to the um, annual meeting. There was no proposal from Area 5, so they did not review any proposals. So anything that we approved for Area 5 did not have a technical review, just to put that up front. Um, and Area 4's uh, landings were much higher over their uh, target goal from the average time frame from 2007 to 2009 than Area 5 was. Um, it's not in Bob's email that I have right in front of me, but I believe it was over 100,000 pounds over. Um, but in light of that, um, the... Uh, the TC did, you know, look at Southern New England as a whole to look at the measures that were put in place for Addendum 17 to get this 10.10% 10 .10 reduction in exploitation. And, you know, we did achieve the 10% reduction in exploitation. Now, whether that was due to the management measures that we put in place or was it due to availability of the resource to be caught is um, questionable. Uh, you know, we don't have the ability to determine for sure whether or not it's the measures or it's the status of the resource. The technical committee would probably say that it's more due to the status of the resource and not the management measures. Um, you know, and Bob did say in his email that, you know, with the goal of rebuilding we're reducing landings by 10%. Yes, it's been achieved for Southern New England. And if you want to hold each state responsible to achieve that 10%, um, that would be up to the management board and you would have a different picture then because some states did achieve that reduction and others did not. Um, you know, the TC strongly argues that um, that you uh, that the stock status is still in a very poor condition, and so if we're not going to um, move move forward with management measures now, which from a technical aspect would be okay, but that the board really does need to um, start preparing for the results of the stock assessment that is coming forward in 2015, and to really think about these management goals that you're trying to achieve for Southern New England and what you're trying to have the fishery look at, um, because that's gonna potentially have a much more restrictive um, measures and goals that may need to be put in place in the future. Um, and I have Bob on the phone now. I'll see if if there's anything I should add. <laughs> Tony, the assessment will be out in May? Um, the assessment should be completed by May. We actually have a stock assessment uh, meeting next week, um, which will give us a much better guide of where our um, completion date would be, where it is our goal to present the results of the assessment and peer review to the board at the August um, meeting. 
Bob, is there anything else I should add? I mean, no, I think we're going to be looking at the preliminary model runs next week. And so we would ex pretty much expect to confirm what I've already outlined for the board. Okay. Thanks. Is that helpful? I think so. Um, any d d further discussion? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I just wanted to uh, supplement um, what Tom O'Connell has said. We're in a similar situation in Virginia. We've been de minimis for quite a while. We have very few uh, lobstermen that land in Virginia. However, when we adopted the February 1 through March 31 closure, it's everywhere. So we have the Area 3 and Area 5 situation that Tom O'Connell mentioned, and uh, to ensure that there would be the complete closure, we just adopted it um, for both areas, essentially, that you can't land during that period in Virginia period. Um, the other part, I think, is in contacting those who do land lobsters in Virginia, they definitely see the same uh, signs that Tom O'Connell mentioned with a May, uh, with an April 29th through May 31st closure in terms of uh, what little they may contribute overall for them, it would be a big impact to have that type of closure. Any other discussion? Yes, Steve. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I've heard a couple different things about, well, we've got people that have fished both Area 4, Area 5, Area 3. Uh, is my understanding, and maybe I misunderstood it, that most restrictive rule applies. So whether you eliminate one of these or not, if you've got them both or three of them stamped on your license, your traps are on the bank, and when anything you're supposed to be fishing in is closed, we shouldn't have displaced effort moving from one zone to the other. Do I misunderstand this? Peter Burns. I don't have it right in front of me, but I believe our rule um, only requires them to, to uh, have the traps out of the out of the area that they're that's closed. Yeah, I, I think. Well, no, go ahead, Peter. I guess I'll just jump in here. You know, we, we just came into, into play with our own federal regulations to come into parity with what the Commission has done with these closures and with, with the 10% uh, goal. Um, and the, these, rec these um, we've heard from the technical committee that from a um, from an uh, area by area basis, um, we've achieved that. We've reached the 10% reductions. And now it comes really down to a state by state type of thing. This seems to be where the discussion is going, whether or not which states have, have, uh, have made the 10% or not. To me, it, it seems like it's really just a, it's a it's an area-based uh, decision, and so I, I think that we've got a stock assessment that's coming down here um, in May. Uh, we've heard from the technical committee a little bit that uh, things you know that might, more information might be available that might require more action by the board. So maybe it might be worthwhile rather than. Um, changing things as we go along here and there, maybe waiting to find out what the next assessment says, where we need to go long term on this, stay the course with what we've done uh, in the agenda that we've already uh, gone through with, and then make the adjustments as needed once we see what the new assessment says. Bill Adler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, is, is the fact that this area didn't make the 10 percent based on the um, the 30,000 pounds rather than the approximate 1,100 pounds? Is is that what is the core as to you didn't make the 10 percent? Is that what's doing it? Yes, I believe it is. But it is actually Tony wants to speak. Go ahead. Okay. Tony. Area five was over their ten percent reduction by eleven thousand one hundred and thirty nine pounds. That was their overage for area five. So when the board included area five into the area four proposal, they then had a, we're taking a more than 10% reduction because this, um, by including them, they're, you're making Area 5 do more than the 10%. 
because they were only over by 1,129 pounds. Uh, the fishermen who are fishing in federal waters do have, just as a to put it out there, do have the opportunity to declare each year into which areas they are fishing in. So a fisherman could decide to only fish in Area 4 or only fish in Area 5 um, from year to year. And so that would be one solution to allow them not to have face a double closure if they didn't want that. So there is an opportunity for that. And every year, federal fishermen can go back and redeclare their area. They don't lose the ability to fish in that area in future years. Bill, go ahead. Okay, Tony, but uh, I'm looking at this thing, and you, you mentioned uh, an 11,000, which I don't see here. Uh, the the basis of my question was that it looks like the use of 30,000 pounds uh, was, was the reason that tipped the thing over, rather than if the 30,000 wasn't there and 1,100 pounds was there, um, it wouldn't have hit the 10 percent. I don't know. Maybe, maybe Maryland could answer that, or however, or maybe you could. All right. Tom O'Connell. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And to avoid the confusion we had at the last meeting, I know if Tony corrected herself, but it's 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 1,100 pounds. So, Area Five had to achieve a 10 percent reduction. The harvest needed to be um, 36,000 pounds. Okay, so that was the, we had to have a harvest of 36,000 pounds total. We actually harvested a little over 37,000 pounds. So we missed achieving the 10% reduction by 1,100 pounds. Our reduction ended up to being not 10%, but 9.3%. All right, any other comments? Yes, Tom. Thank you. I do have a question, I guess, for, for maybe Tony. Um, if a permit, hold, if a permit, a lobsterman has permits for four and five, and there's this discrepancy in, in the, the um, season closures, they're still restricted to both closures. Is, is that correct? If they declare both areas for that fishing year on their permit, yes. But if they only opt into one of the areas, then no. Thank you. Okay, um, maybe we can get uh, a motion on this issue from Tom. Yeah, I'll, I'll move to reconsider the following motion from the October 2014 meeting. Move to approve a closed season from April 30th to May 31st for lobster conservation management area four and five to achieve the required 10% reduction in addendum 17 and allow the setting of unbaited lobster traps one week prior to the season reopening. So you're asking the board to uh, reverse that motion, and if so we'd need a two-thirds majority. Yes, John Clark? Second by John Clark. Any discussion on the motion? Jim Gilmore? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and just to, so I got this perfectly clear, Steve Train had said there was no impact essentially on that, you know, the, the, because of the most restrictive rule. But Tony's actually saying there is an impact because you essentially could lose season. Because we went through this two years ago between area four and six, and when we tried to make the same argument, it turns out we kind of had to eat it. So um, right now, uh, it seems like there is an impact because you could potentially lose season. So that's quite Question number one. And question two is to Tom's motion. Um, so we're reopening this, but we're, we're going to. This is just for area five. Area four was just that the that was the existing motion. So we're, are we talking about screwing around with area four too or not? Thanks, Tom McConnell. You know, my interest is uh, in Area 5, but since the motion included both, we have to reconsider that and then entertain discussion on 5 specifically, and others may have an interest to consider 4. Dave Simpson. 
Sorry, just um, for clarity to, to understand where you're going, Tom, is, is it your plan to, to propose an alternative season for Area 5 that on paper would achieve the 10 percent reduction? Yeah, my objective if this motion passed is to uh, move that we go back to the February and March closure that was adopted in Addendum 17. And uh, as I stated, we we achieved a 9.3% reduction. We see how 14 plays out. We got the new assessment, and then we uh, take you know determine what the best course is for 2016. Richie White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, that being said, would it not be cleaner for us to understand this to include that in this motion so that we know where we're going for sure before we approve this? Tom, do you want to amend that motion? I just I was going off the advice from staff that we first needed to reconsider this. If, uh, if we can do it differently, I'm open to that. Looking for some advice. Staff says we can do it differently, so proceed. So, so Tom, you're going to isolate uh, Area Five uh, as a second part of this motion? Yeah, with the best course, just to uh, reference this being a reconsideration for the Area Five component. Maybe I get a little help with the language there. Tony's coming to your rescue. Richie White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. While, while that's being uh, sorted out, a uh, question for Peter. Um, I, I thought most restrictive rule covered everything. Um, and so I guess I'm kind of curious if, if it, it doesn't uh, work in this area. Are there any others uh, where most restrictive uh, does not cover? Peter Burns. We're checking our most recent rule on that right now, so we can get back to you in just a minute. Tom O'Connell. So um, what I'd like to add to the motion, if uh, the seconder agrees, is to move to approve a closed season of February 1st to March 31st and mandatory V-notch in for LCMA 5, as specified in Addendum 17. Can I get a second on that amendment, John Clark? Thank you. And do you want to speak to it? Just, just a little point of confusion. I thought the reconsidering the motion that's already been passed requires two-thirds vote, and wouldn't the second motion just require a majority rather than a two-thirds? Bob Beal. The, the way the boards have usually handled this is by doing it all in one motion. So, you know, the, the motion would say we would like to reconsider this and replace it with that. And that's what Tony's working on right now. So it would all be in one motion. It would be a two-thirds vote to um, approve that. And then it wouldn't be a, you know, because I think we get into some confusion if it's a two-step process of two-thirds for a reconsideration and then a simple majority for the actual motion. Because a lot of times we get into the spot, I think, that Richie brought up, with, which was I'm not sure if I want to reconsider until I know where we're going with this. So I think if we put it all in this one motion, Motion, have a two-thirds vote, we're all set. Thank you. Peter Burns. Hi, just to follow up on Richie White's question, and this, what I said before, is correct that um, there isn't any most restrictive of these particular closures. So if somebody had multiple areas on their federal lobster permit and uh, Area 5 happened to be closed and the other areas were open, they could fish the traps in the other areas. But I also want to just take the opportunity, too, to um, just uh, throw out there that this hasn't really been, I know that the TC has looked at this, but it hasn't really been looked at uh, in the context of other areas and impacts across the fishery as a whole. You know, we, again, we do have uh, more information coming with a stock assessment, so um, I would just say uh, keep in mind that uh, with that more information, uh, the board may be um, obligated to take further action uh, down the road here soon. What? 
All right, um, any other discussion? If, if I'll read the motion. Any comment from the audience before I read the motion? Yes, come to the microphone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Brandon Muffley with New Jersey Marine Fisheries. I just want to, from New Jersey's perspective, we don't have a necessarily a problem with the trying to address Area 5. In New Jersey, specifically in Area 5, we actually achieved a 33% reduction in Area 5 through the, the measures of the February-March closure and the mandatory V-notching. The problem that we do run into is we have this split in New Jersey, and we also have a federal rule now that says Area 4 and 5 fishermen are going to be closed closed February and March, have a mandatory V-notching approach, and we also have regulations that we approve because of the board's action in October that are closing our fishermen in May as well. So now our fishermen in areas four and five are going to have a three-month closure, um, which is going to be, um, I don't think, what was the intent, because they're, they're going to have to follow federal rules um, if they're fishing in that area. So we're going to be closed in February and March, and we're going to be closed in May because we've already taken regulatory action to make that change in May. So I just wanted to point that out. Tom O'Connell. Yeah, just to me, you know, I don't, I don't have an opposition for including Area 5, but my interest is, uh, including Area 4, but my interest is there in a, uh, Area 5 right now. If somebody wanted to amend the motion. Richie White. Uh, question, uh, implementation of this, um, I mean, this would not go into effect until it was uh, approved by the service, so I don't know that that, this, that would happen this year. It, I don't know if Peter could comment on that. Peter? Right, no fisheries would have to go uh, and complete a rulemaking uh, before next year, before 2016, in order to change the closures to uh, May, for the May closure. Otherwise, the state and federal regulations wouldn't be in alignment, and technically, uh, somebody would, would have um, the state and the federal closures, so February, March, and May. So this means another, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tom O'Connell, this means that you're not going to be closing April and May of, of this year. You would be intending to do that in 16? No, the, the, the motion would allow us to uh, maintain the closure for February and March of this year, allow our guys to fish in May, and then determine what the results of the stock assessment and see if any further management change is needed for 2016. And absent this vote, NIMS doesn't have a complementary rule that would close in April and May. So you would be closing this on your own in, uh, within, the, within your state. So can I, uh, Dave Simpson, did you want to speak? I, I just wanted to be clear, and I think the conversation helped me. So right now there's a federal rule that says February 1 through um, March 31 at least, we're closed. So there's no concern about timing here. They're already closed. They can't fish. And this would take care of the problem for May. Okay. That's great. Thanks. Yes, Tom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to amend the motion to include Area 4. Is there a second on that request to amend the motion? I have a second from Emerson. Thank you. Discussion on the motion to amend to include Area 4. Tom, do you want to speak to it? Yes, I would. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, just to include Area 4 for the, area, um, the concerns of consistency, for enforcement concerns, and, and just to avoid the excessive restrictions of the close, of, of the close seasons. Thank you. Anyone want to speak in opposition to, to that? Just a clarification. 
Go ahead, Tom. Just for, in, in regards to Dave Simpson's last question, I just want to make it sure, make it make it clear that the federal rulemaking that was just published is for 2016, not for 2015. Dave Simpson. So right now it's what is it? February 4th today. Are you guys fishing or are you closed? Uh, we are closed. We have an emergency regulation pending to close April and May, pending this meeting. So as a state, you, you're a year ahead of the National Marine Fisheries Service on that reg. Correct. Jim Gilmore. All right, so someone needs to explain this to me. So now that we added four, we didn't meet um, the 10% reduction by like, I think it was 80,000 pounds. So if we include this, are we, are we uh, um, essentially eliminating the reduction um, in area four also so that we don't have that 10% requirement? Tony? Jim, you are correct that Area 4 did not meet the 10% reduction. Overall, if you look at all of the landings that were reduced in southern New England over the time period against, against the 2007 to 2009, the reduction was met. The TC is saying because we met the full reduction in all of southern New England, if you add Area 4 or don't add Area 4 to this proposal, so be it. But that you do have an assessment that is coming in 2015. There is, the picture does not look any better so far from the, it, the, the landings and the surveys that we have in front of us. I'm not saying what the result of the assessment will be because they haven't actually done those runs yet, but it's likely you're not gonna get anything better. So you're gonna have to continue to take reductions in Southern New England. So wait until the assessment comes out. Think about your goals and objectives between now and then, and then we'll have to come back and do some more management measures down the road. Jim Gilmore. Well, now I'll follow up with Jersey. So after the last meeting, we went back and we did rulemaking and we already put this in place. And now um, this is a bit of a mess because now I um, trust me doing like every other state doing rulemaking is not fun and not easy. And now I have to go revise that. Um, so. Um, as much as I, I, I completely agree with what's going on in Area 5, and I, I had no issue with that. This I have major headaches with just because of the way this has been preceded. So I'm going to have to vote against the motion simply because Area 4 was included in it. Um, it could begin because we've already, get, we're down the road. We put our rules in and we're already closed that area, and I don't know if I can undo it. Thank you. Well, the motion to amend hasn't been enacted yet, right? We're still voting on whether to include Area 4. Area f uh, four, yeah. John. Uh, thanks, Dan. Just a clarification again. Even uh, under the rules, those who have joint permits for four and five, they would only be closed for four. If four was closed, they could still fish five. Was that what was said? Just wanted to be clear on that. Thank. You. All right, so let's get a, a, a vote, if we're ready, on whether to include LCMA4 in this motion. And this will be a simple majority. Local? No. Okay. All right, uh, all in favor of including Area 4 in this motion? All opposed? Null votes, abstentions. All right, motion fails. So now we're back to the, the main motion for which we need a two-thirds majority, which would uh, reverse the, the uh, changes made in, in October uh, for Area 5, uh, going back to status quo, which is the two-month closure, February and March, and mandatory V-notching. So we'll need a two-thirds majority, and we'll, and we'll do a roll call on that. Can I have a, a con? Uh, can we have a conference thing here? Sure. Do you want to uh, take a few minutes to caucus? Okay. Joe, did you have an issue? I, shall I read it now while they're caucusing? Move to reconsider the following motion from October 2014. 
move to approve a closed season from April 30th to May 31st for lobster conservation management area four and five to achieve the required 10% reduction in addendum 17 and allow the setting of unbaited lobster traps one week prior to the season reopening and replace the following measures for LCMA 5, a closed season of February 1 through March 31st and with mandatory V-notching, motion by Mr. O'Connell, second by Mr. Clark. Peter Burns. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just to clarify this, where, where we're headed on this. So this motion is not only a motion to reconsider, but it's also a replacement. And so we would be voting on not only um, reconsidering the initial vote for four and five, but then replacing uh, the area five that was initially in place. Is that right? Yeah, the intent is to, uh, if, it, if it's not worded clear enough, the intent is to leave the Area 4 rules intact of the late April through May closure. All right, do we need time to caucus? Let's, let's take uh, 60 seconds to caucus. Is this okay? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I just didn't know. Do we need more time to caucus? No. All right, let's uh, let's cast our votes on the motion as presented on the board through roll call. Uh, go ahead. Maine. Yes. New Hampshire? Yes. Massachusetts? Yes. Rhode Island? Yes. Connecticut? Yes. New York? Yes. New Jersey? No. Delaware? Yes. Maryland? Yes. Virginia? Yes. National Marine Fishery Service? Abstain. Motion passes. Motion passes nine to one with one abstention. All right, any other uh, discussion or any other business on that front? I don't think so. All right, we'll go to our next item, which is uh, a review of Maine's uh, pilot trap tag project. Uh, I think um, Commissioner Kelleher was scheduled, uh, but uh, he won't be attending today. So Terry, do you want to start it off? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I begin, I want to introduce to the board uh, Colonel um, John Cornish. Uh, John has um, uh, been promoted into Joe Fezzen's uh, seat, who retired at the um, first of the year. So welcome, John. Um, I want to refer everyone to the uh, handout in our supplemental materials, and I'm going to draw off of that briefly with a few talking points before turning it over to John for questions and answers. But uh, uh, to, to lay out the issues, Maine does not issue uh, the 10% uh, trap tag replacements. Um, consequently, Maine Marine Patrol administers a very burdensome and complex replacement prog uh, um, program that tracks every individual uh, trap tag transaction for uh, approximately 30,000 uh, replacement tags a year. The Department and the Marine Patrol went through a management review and, and to identify a way to streamline the process given the, the, the resource issues and the time it was taking for both the industry and, and the Marine Patrol. And this, uh, uh, John and some other officers uh, pre presented this concept to the, um, to the Enforcement Committee at the annual meeting. Um, so DMR uh, is proposing a pilot program uh, for one year that would be monitored by Marine Patrol, and we would intend, uh, if it's approved by the board, to uh, report back to this board a year from now at the winter meeting. And um, should the board support this pilot program, Maine will um, um, adopt some new rules that are identified in the handout and, uh, and proceed accordingly. So I'm going to turn it over to John for any more details that I've missed and for any questions and answers. John, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for allowing me to speak today. I know I'm kind of between, I'm in a hard spot. I had a hard time getting here with the weather, and now I'm sitting between everybody and lunch, and uh, I'm in the hot seat, and uh, I replaced uh, Joe Pheasant, who's an icon, so uh, got a little pressure on me here, but... Uh, 
I'll talk about an issue here that's uh, burdened Maine for quite a few years now. We've had quite a few internal discussions about it, and um, we're really looking for some relief uh, from the board today on this issue. Um, as you know, Maine has uh, approximately 5,000 licensed lobstermen, um, and we distribute approximately 300 commercial uh, lobster tags per year. Um, when a fisherman uh, replaces traps, uh, which is common, um, they are under the current requirement. They have to take their tag out of the trap and bring it to the Marine Patrol, fill out a form, uh, and uh, we issue them um, a new tag. And you're probably all familiar with you're probably all familiar with the tags. Uh, this is a you know example of what they look like. So a fisherman will show up at one of my satellite offices with a bag of tags. Might be five, might be 20, might be 50. Um, I have a very small support staff. Uh, we have two secretaries that work in two satellite offices, uh, and I have a sergeant or, or a lieutenant that mans that office. Uh, this is taking a, an extraordinary uh, large amount of their time, not only to exchange the tags, but to, to uh, log the, ent enter all the new numbers into the data system, into the database, and make it all clean. Uh, Maine does 95%, and I throw that number out because it's pretty close, uh, of our enforcement on gear in the water. We have a very efficient um, uh, large boat fleet, and uh, we're underway all the time. We haul tens of thousands of traps each year. Uh, we do not have a large amount of uh, untagged gear. We do make a few cases each year. Uh, we do enforce uh, uh, the trap tag uh, limits all the way out uh, to Area 3 and into Area 3. Uh, and of course, it's burdensome to us to, to be out there uh, 35 miles offshore, even in our 45-foot uh, patrol boats. Uh, by allowing uh, fishermen, as opposed to um, bringing these tags to us and exchanging them, to be able to transfer them back into uh, another trap, uh, it will take a great deal of uh, administrative pressure off my folks. We don't think, because of our enforcement efforts in Maine, and I don't know if this exists in other states, but because of our enforcement efforts on the water in Maine, by looking at the gear, inspecting it, by hauling it up, uh, that this will have a big impact. I know there are concerns that people will take gear, go out to the fishing areas, um, snap the tags out, and drop the gear in the water, and that uh, that will be a, a problem. We don't think that's a big problem in Maine right now. Uh, and if it were, all the fishermen would have to do is bring those tags back in, and we would give them replacement tags for them. So we're really not accomplishing a lot uh, by requiring um, them to leave the trap and leave the tag in the trap. Um, we're really looking for a pilot program here. We don't want to, we're not, uh, we know other states may not be interested in doing this. Uh, we want to try it for a year, test it out, report back to the board um, a year from now at the winter meeting as to how it goes. Uh, we have, uh, I have talked to the law enforcement committee on this. Uh, we did a presentation last year. We recently had a conference call on it. Uh, so uh, we have uh, opened it up to discussion. Um, and uh, we'd like to ask for your support uh, on this measure as we move forward. We do have some draft language for, regula for a state regulation. Uh, we have proposed a regulation at the state level. If this committee today does not support this pilot project, we will, uh, we will stop that uh, regulation process and uh, stay status quo. But we'd appreciate your support. And I'll answer any questions you might have. Any questions for John? Yes, Doug Grout. Yeah, I guess the first question I have is is uh, more for staff because of the um, section in in the management plan that says all trap tags shall be a permanent design, not transferable once attached to the trap. Uh, can we do this uh, under our management plan uh, uh, without some kind of a management action? You are correct, Doug, that that is what the plan says. So it would be a waiver to that. You would be allowing a waiver to that plan. So the board has the authority to waive a, a specific management measure for a, for a single state if they show disease, they show choose. Bob Beal. 
you know, the, the plan does not directly give the board that authority or prevent that from happening. So it's kind of one of these gray areas. There is that provision in the plan that this would, would be in conflict with, but it, you know, as, as Maine has indicated, this is a pilot program. Um, uh, and it's really at the, you know, it's, it's a choice of the board. Is this, do you feel that um, attaching those or reattaching cut tags with hog rings or whatever it is to the trap is, is consistent with the spirit of the wording of the plan right now? You know, the, it does introduce some transferability, but, you know, they are affixed to the trap. So it's up, it's up to the group whether you, you, know, you feel you're comfortable with this pilot program or not. Yeah, I think the, um, the language was drafted probably about 16 years ago that's in the plan, and I'm guessing that we've learned a lot. Um, I know Maine, uh, Maine and the other states actually have different approaches. Uh, my state, I think New Hampshire as well, allows the issuance of the extra tags. So clearly they're in a different situation. They also have a fleet of, of active vessels that um, are pretty vigilant about enforcement. Um, I think we all wish we had that level of enforcement. So um, it, it seems to me that it uh, it deserves a, a, a they deserve an opportunity to run this pilot program for a year. Um, Bill Adler, um, I have no problem with this. Um, However, uh, I just wanted to know, uh, ask Maine and law enforcement, uh, do you have a pretty good handle on how you will watch this so the report that comes back, it'll be a good report that comes back whether it did or it didn't work, but you have a way uh, of doing the watch on this, do you? That's a that's a great question. Um, we are we're, we have uh, we, our plan is to um, you know continue to enforce the, the trap tag law as we just currently do, uh, and to uh, um, continue to inspect here. Um, we don't. It, it will be very difficult. It will be very difficult to, to to design a way to see how effective this is, because we don't think that. It's being violated now. We don't think that the current process is being violated, or if it is, it's at a small scale. So um, it would be very difficult to do, you know, to, to do that. We're going to continue to inspect the air, or talk to fishermen. We have a lot of outreach meetings. We have a lot of zone council meetings. Um, we, you know, we'll, we'll continue to uh, feather through the issue and try to figure out how that, you know, how to do that. Bill. Uh, okay. So in other words, you've got a plan to see how, whether this is going to work or not. You've got some type of a way you're going to test this. Yes, we're going to we're going to continue to do what we always have done and inspect the air and and make sure that uh, um, we assume that fishermen, once this catches on, will not be coming to our offices anymore to exchange tags. There will be no need to do that. Uh, so certainly, that will be one way to test uh, how, how 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 you know common it is. We will also be as we inspect the air, we'll be keeping track of how many fishermen are hog ringing gear in. Now there's very few that do it. It's illegal to to, to put gear in without a tag it the way they're formatted to be attached or built to be attached. So we'll be doing some surveys on how that how fishermen are attaching the gear and coming back with some numbers. Um, you know, I, I guess I'd have to tell you, to be honest, we have not developed a complete uh, uh, process on how we're going to do that yet, but we will be doing that. Let me, let me get some comments from uh, Steve Train from Maine and then Richie White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't want to prolong this. Um, not having the 80%, uh, the 10% uh, extra of the 800, the extra 80 tags, is leaves us at a disadvantage because when we're rotating traps, they're not in the fishery. We're losing money, and if we want to rotate new gear and old gear, we've got to cut the tags out, turn them into an officer, and wait. By allowing us to cut the tags out, hog ringing them into another trap, and put them back in the water, it keeps us efficient. Uh, an honest guy is never going to be a problem anyway. He's never going to be an issue. It just enables him to make a live in and do things a little bit easier. The enforcement we have on the water is tremendous. You're going to have a pirate in every fishery and you're going to have it in every state and you're not going to catch them and this is going to make it easier for them. You're not going to catch them every time. That's not the problem. It's the honest guys that are struggling with the rule we have now. Richie White. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the intent would be to try this for the, a year. You come back and report to us, and then uh, if it's successful, then we would initiate an addendum to change the plan. Is that is that the process that you, you would see it, Dan? I do, yes. Tony? Just a question um, for the other elements of the plan for the trap tags. Um, we have to make sure that the area fished permit number is also written on the tags. So when they cut the tags and then reaffix them with the hog rings, hog rings, that won't be obstructed or mutilated in any way. The information that's on the tag is that correct? Yes, that would be correct. Um, there is a provision in the language that we have in rule that will require them. It's actually going to be easier for us to do enforcement because the tag will have to be uh, visible. Right now, the tag can be put in the trap, and if an officer is inspecting a trap, oftentimes they have to reach into their trap and try to twist the tag around. It's very time-consuming um, ice and weather conditions. And under this provision, the, tra the trap tag, if it's hogging in, will be visible. You look right down on top of it. It'll be you know similar to this. You'll be looking right down on top of the tag. Peter Burns. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. John, I was just curious whether this was just going to be state-only uh, Maine lobstermen or federal permit holders. And the reason I'm asking is because you know our federal regulations require that the trap tags be permanently um, affixed to the traps. So um, certainly, um, if you're doing a pilot program, you're just going to see how it's going to work out. It'd be interesting to see whether whether that would just be a state-based thing or not. Well, the, the tags will still be permanently affixed to the traps, uh, so, and it will, it, you know, will be everybody, all Maine fishermen, whether they fish in federal waters or state waters. Okay, what's uh, Peter? Do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I just want to get an idea if you know how many. Because uh, I, I read the report, it looks like it's just a reg. You get some change in your regulatory text, and if you've got um, a certain number of permit holders or licensees that you expect will participate in this, or, or is it by zone, or do you know yet? We don't know, but we our thought process is that once this is out there, it will become a, a very common place that uh, most fishermen will hog ring their tra tags in into the traps and, and, be, and re, you know, re, remove them and put them into other traps as they, as they shift gear around. All right, we have five minutes left of the meeting. I want to get um, a motion to uh, endorse this uh, one-year pilot program. Uh, Steve Train, that's, is that you want to... A motion by Steve Train to uh, endorse Maine's request for a one-year pilot program. Second in the motion. Anyone? Phil Adler, thank you. Uh, Second that motion. Is thank that you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Uh, yes, Doug Grout. So a follow-up question here is, a, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, quite frankly, uh, our law enforcement committee member had some concerns with this. And so I wanted to ask, you said you had presented this um, program at the fall meeting, and I understood there was a conference call of the LEC um, that uh, happened last week, I believe. And I wonder, I, I don't want to, uh, I'll put you on on the spot, John, uh, in reporting for the LEC, uh, but what, what was uh, the LEC as a whole uh, uh, response to this pr program? Sure, Doug. I don't mind answering that at all. At the original uh, presentation last fall that was done by a couple of lieutenants from Maine, uh, there was some concern from the LAC uh, that this may not work in their state and uh, for, for their purposes. Uh, and uh, that's kind of when the decision was made to go the pirate pilot project route and have it only impact Maine. Uh, on the conference call the other day, there were uh, uh, 19 people on the call. Uh, the uh, Pat Moran uh, spoke up and just his concerns were that, uh, hopefully I can speak for him here, uh, his concerns were that um, how it would impact his state and um, you know he was advised that at this time it wouldn't have any impact on, on his state and uh, Rob, uh, um, uh, is it Mark Robson? 
uh, Mark had indicated that uh, Rhode Island had some reservations on this. Uh, I, be I believe uh, Kurt Blanchard had some reservations on it. Kurt was not on the call, and I, I believe uh, Kurt's reservations were uh, going back, to, as was mentioned earlier, the 16 years when this took place, um, looking back at that and why it was done in the first place. You know, why would we, why would we want to change it? All right, uh, Peter Burns. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. John, I just want to say that I, th I think it's a, a very interesting proposal, um, and I certainly uh, agree that whenever there's a way that you can uh, try to improve things for fishermen and make it easier for them, and, and as long as it's still enforceable, um, that we should, uh, as a group, uh, be able to uh, explore those kinds of options. But I'm looking at our federal regulations, and I'm just not sure whether or not I can support this, because I think it's going to require, um, it's just going to run afoul of our federal regs, because even though I know that they're going to be uh, the, the rings are going to be uh, affixed to the traps with the hog rings. It's not permanently attached. So I don't know how we would address this. So I think, you know, my recommendation would be if you're going to do a pilot project, if you could keep it within just state uh, permit holders, then that might make it a lot cleaner for us. Um, I don't know if I can support it on the record the way it is now. Richie White. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to confirm my understanding, so th this pilot program is for all license holders uh, in the state. In other words, it's not you're not going to take a subset uh, and, and try it. It's for it's for all fishermen. That's correct. It would be for all fishermen. It would be very difficult to break out a subset and to do it that way. We yeah. follow up, Mr. Chair. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> do you now track? Uh, um, in your enforcement efforts, uh, the amount of traps you haul that do not have tags on them presently, so that there would be something to compare this to um, <clears throat> during this during this uh, trial to see whether there's an increase of hauling uh, gear without without tags. Absolutely. Uh, we, we have uh, all our boats have boat logs and every time a, a trawl is hauled, if there's a trap, a single trap or uh, that doesn't, doesn't have a tag in it, that's logged. And we have a records of all that. Um, okay, let's get a, a vote on this motion. Uh, move, the motion is to endorse Maine's pilot trap program for one year. Motion by Mr. Train, seconded by Mr. Adler. All in favor. Opposed. Uh, abstentions. Null votes. Passes with uh, nine to two. Thank you very much. All right, the last item in the agenda is a quick update on the draft Jonah Crab uh, FMP from Marin Hawk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, staff passed around to the board a letter that we received from the New England Fishery Management Council concerning Jonah Crab. I just wanted to point it out to your attention. In that letter, the council asks that um, we include a member from the council on the, Jonah, on the lobster board to represent any future actions that may include Jonah Crab. And then the second thing, very quickly, is we are still moving forward on the development of the fishery management plan for Jonah Crab, but we have run into some issues the plan development team has. So we would like to uh, formulate a working group to help uh, answer any questions that that plan development team has. So if we could have a couple um, volunteers from the board, that would be very helpful to us. Looking for volunteers on what particular issues, to, what expertise are you looking for? Um, we're trying to parse through a, a good way to characterize the fishery and also um, to differentiate between directed and non-directed trips. In the past, the Lobster Board has requested that any Jonah Crab fishermen include a lobster permit, uh, but in federal waters this isn't very feasible, so, you know, just, I guess, general expertise on the Jonah Crab fishery. Any volunteers? Uh, Bill Adler? Um, anybody from the Gulf of Maine? Bill's from the Gulf of Maine, of course, but um, the state of Maine. If I may. Yes, Bill. What about um, uh, Dave Borden? Would he be a good Can, guy? Yeah, I'd like to volunteer the vice chairman who couldn't make it. So that's. <laughs> 
right? <laughs> that help you? Uh, okay. All right. And if Marie needs more help, she'll just reach out to the board members directly. Tony Kearns. And just to go back to the first part of Marin's um, presentation or discussion, that uh, we would just need consensus from this board if there's not objection that uh, we can invite the New England Council uh, chair or uh, executive director or their proxy to sit on the lobster board as a voting member, which the uh, charter does allow for that to occur. Okay. Tom Fody? Since there's a lot of members of the New England Council that are sitting on here, could we just do this one of the proxies instead of putting in an individual on? Save money for the commission, that's what I'm looking at. Doug Rout? Um, the New England Council made it clear that it would be someone other than, than uh, the state directors uh, that would be on there that they'd be appointed. They wanted some, someone different. And uh, uh, so Terry or the executive director will be appointing someone other than Mark, myself, or him. Thank you, Doug. All right. Um, any other business before the board today? Bill Adler. Uh, very quickly, we have a, an advisory panel nomination for the uh, Jonah Crab fishery, I believe that was in the paperwork. Do we have that? We do. We, uh, we've sent around the memo, but since we're pressed for time today, we're going to continue with that via email. We're going to what? Continue with that via email, because we've had a couple more nominations come in. All right. Are we going to approve the guy that did apply? Uh, not at this time, no. Thank you. All right, no other business? Meetings adjourned. Thank you very much.